Welcome to Real Flicks Reviews. We're like a book club for people who hate reading. This week it's James's pick, and we're doing the movie Who Framed Roger Rabbit, made in 1988. This week we have Jonathan Charney, James Stevens, Hello. and the freak in the lower left-hand corner is Ryan Preston. And we bring you movie news at the end of the program. This week it's Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and one of the two miscreants have... Uh, a little description of it. Uh, I got it here, actually. Um, <laughs> Who Framed Roger Rabbit, 1988. A toon-hating detective uh, is a cartoon rabbit's only hope to prove his innocence when he is accused of murder. Who? It's write- like they're trying to explain it to an alien. Who writes these descriptions? It's like it's, Reddit. It's, yeah, it's just the most general, like, here's the one bullet point about this movie. It's like it's a there's a there's a subreddit on Reddit called uh, Explain Like I'm Five. This this that reminds me very similar of it. Dude, that's like a horrible description of this movie. I'm yeah, well, uh, it's, yeah. I mean, leave it to IMDb just to be as vague as possible. That's, very. That's a really <clears throat> bad description. I did want to say something before we started. James brought it up last week about. <coughs> <coughs> excuse me. About the different characters of diff- uh, the different characters showing up, and according to that the was Ryan. Uh, oh, Ryan. Oh, Ryan. I'm sorry. According to the Bastion of All Wisdom uh, Wikipedia, it was actually Steven Spielberg who convinced Warner Brothers, Flesher Studios, King King's Features Syndicate for Felix the Cat Productions, Turner Entertainment, Universal Pictures, and Lance Production to lend their characters to the show to the movie. Wow. They did, however, there were some they couldn't get, like Popeye, Tom and Jerry, Casper the Friendly Ghost, stuff like that. Really? Um, but there were some caveats um, that was interesting, like uh, Donald and Daffy and the, the piano scene. Yeah. They, all, they, right. all, they all had to be able to play the, the same. They were all had to be equal players. Hmm. Oh, really? Yeah, so there were some little, you can do this, but you can't do that. You can't play up Disney over Warner Brothers or yeah. Warner Brothers over Disney. Yeah, they have to be very similar. That's huh. funny. You know, and I was actually thinking when I was watching this movie again how great of a scene that was between Donald and Daffy. Oh, that was a great yeah, scene. That's yeah. like one of the best scenes ever. I thought that. Right. the thing I liked about that is it all played to the characters' strengths and the, the, the way they were, and it didn't really lessen either character. And I thought it was great that they also had Betty Boop as a cigarette girl right there. Right? Yeah, oh, God, that was amazing. Uh, it's perfect because she, I mean, that's, I, I think that's what she was drawn at. Well, yeah, you know, she was a very, she was kind of, I think she was kind of a risque cartoon for yeah. the day. You know, one yeah, of the yeah. amazing things uh, to me rewatching this movie uh, 24 years later after it's been made. Now, guys, really, 24 years mm-hmm. after this yeah. movie is made, how much detail they went into creating these characters into a real world scenario. Oh, yeah. They did a yeah. lot of work. Like, and, even and in that like, scene. Not, not, not even. I mean, how well they mesh together. I mean, you, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to watch something that they're doing now really well. I'm going to watch them try to attempt to do it 24 years ago. And then you watch it and you're like, holy shit. It's, I mean, it's, it's almost just as good yeah. as well, they, anything you would see I now mean, as far as the, the, the merriment between uh, live action and, well, that's, and animation. Well, I mean, you can even see uh, Jessica Rabbit's <clears throat> hand actually go under Eddie Valiant's coat. Yeah. When she's right. like sitting on his lap and rubbing him and opening up his jacket, grabbing handkerchiefs out of the, There's so much interaction into real world with these characters right. that they did so well. Yeah. Right, and it's the little things like that that are going to sell the whole idea of the movie. Well, yeah. they've been they've been doing interaction between uh, composite stuff for a long time. Um, and the Wrath of Titans and stuff with that. But this one, I think, is when they started getting really well on live action versus uh, cartoon or versus uh, computer generated. Yeah. I think this is when it started yeah. noticing how it was just the, the, the practical effects really added to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you could, you could tell it, there was a big collaboration between the, the practical effects uh, artists really being in cahoots with the animators saying, yeah. okay, what exactly is going to be going on? Because I want to match that with, like you said, the coat moving or, or whatever happening, you know? Uh, yeah. I was going to say, I was reading, uh, I think it was Wikipedia somewhere else who was talking about how some, there was somebody dressed up as Roger the Rabbit in the scenes. Yes, uh, Charles Fleischer um, w- was one of the points that I was going to bring up of how really? dedicated yeah. this guy was to his role. 
Uh, and uh, he was the guy who did Roger Rabbit, not only Roger Rabbit, but also uh, oh, Benny wow. the Cab. The Cab. Uh, and two of the Weasel Gang, Psycho oh, and nice. Greasy. He oh, did. Wow. Well, I mean, you know, great Charles Fleischer. I mean, one of those, you know, man of a thousand voices, another Mel Blanc kind of kind of character. I mean, he's just that's how he made his living. Yeah, um, really great. Uh, un- as far as I'm concerned, one of the most underrated voice actors of that era. I mean, he yeah. was yeah, he like he said Mel Blanc, like he wasn't like you know put out there as much, but he did a lot of uh, really great voices and very well. But um, yeah, right. he dressed up in a in a bunny costume for uh, Hopkins mm-hmm. for certain That's for certain awesome. scenes. Yeah. That must have been surreal for for Hoskins. Yeah, I mean to just be standing there looking at the guy who voices Roger Rabbit in a rabbit costume. That yeah. would throw me, man. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he did it so that so that when he was talking, when he was in scenes talking to Roger Rabbit, it was for the right. There's a point yeah. of reference. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, but nowadays they use a tennis ball on a stick. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's I'd be like, God damn it, Charles, can you just stand oh like behind me or something and give me the voice so I don't have to look at you in this crazy rabbit costume? I think because I, I just keep thinking I'm on acid. The, oh, wow. the worst thing about this whole thing though is Bob Hoskins retired from acting because of Parkinson's. Yeah. Because I really because yeah they they were going to make uh 2010 they were going to make a sequel they were talking about it and then he retired and it's just like you know I was really bummed. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's yeah. a great actor. Um, yeah, well, I mean, he he always has that role. Anything you've any movie you've seen him in, he's the one you remember. He's yeah. the scene stealer, you know. Yeah. So Even anyway, in Hook, when he's playing opposite uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman and Robin Williams, I mean, every scene that he's in, you're watching him. Yeah, Shmi is always the better character. Yeah, but I mean, he he hopped in the the Peter Pan one, the Never the Neverland that. We yeah, talked about yeah, that's before. right. Oh right, yeah, he was he, he reprised that. his yeah. role of Smee in, in the the Neverland. Yeah, which was really great because I mean that would not have made that so good if right. I mean it was a different Smee because he well, is you, Shmi. you know everybody over the age of uh, like twenty five was was looking at it like hey you guys you guys you guys seeing this and everybody under the age is like I don't know what you're what you're pointing at what are you what are you talking about Yeah, it's just the guy playing Smee. Who cares Yeah, it's, a, it's okay <laughs> Smee. What, what's the big deal like, anyway. you don't understand he was Smee before he was Smee and this is the it's it's kind of stuff meta bitch like pay attention They're wondering what Peter Pan is first So so besides the actual logistics of this movie what I just think are fantastic great even the cinematography the colors everything kind of fits with what the role is I think even the storyline is is really nostalgic I, I think it's just oh, a great yeah. storyline. I mean, Cloverleaf is taking over the red line, and they're trying to get rid of it so that they can bring in the new industrial uh, idea of the freeway. That right. was, yeah. That, <laughs> which, uh, Ryan, I, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, because, you know, Christopher Lloyd's character, Doom, brings up mm-hmm. a really great point that, I mean, freeways are going to, uh, you know, get rid of the, the traffic jams. They're going to be a thing of the past. Do you feel like <laughs> right. that? Yeah, no, see, I'm, I'm from <laughs> Los Angeles, California, where this movie happens to take place. Um, the, the the freeway that they're technically referring to is the 110 freeway. It's yep. called the Arroyo Seco Parkway, and it's the first freeway ever built in the country. And it was really just a quick way to get from, like, Pasadena, where, like, the Rose Bowl takes place, down to downtown Los Angeles, because it's all, like, mountain terrain. But it was just this old crappy waterway that they just put a road on top of. So it's really windy Pretty and much. crappy. And it's one of the most backed up freeways you could ever possibly imagine. Um, I think they just even came out with a poll of like, you know, worst cities for traffic. Um, I think we were like number two or three. Well, actually, uh, um, L.A. would not work <laughs> the way the way that New York works. It the, You have to have the freeways. Because of the right. fact that because I mean, nobody there is no public transportation here anymore. Well, yeah. Like there there used to I be a the small uh, um, a rail car system. I can't remember what it was called. The like uh, something angels. Um, no, he's talking about something. I'll different. think of it later. Oh. Anyway, but uh, it it, was we used to have some kind of a version of it. But after you know the freeways, everybody's buying cars. And unlike New York, L.A. is is really sprawling. It's spread out so well, far. Well, you know that, that you there can't, is, you can't live here without having a car. 
there there was a idea early in the plans of of Southern California where they were going to try to put in a subway system like New York. They were trying to model that idea. Right. And it was shot down and what John doesn't know is that there was actually a system of cars. Yeah, no, I actually that, knew that. That were modeled after San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Right. Because they were trying to do it that way, too, and it just yeah. wasn't working, and they finally went to freeway. Well, the, the interesting yeah, they thing... Yeah, there were more trolley, but, I mean, they still had a couple of, of underground ones, but it was just really, really impractical to, to design it. Well, the, You know, I mean, especially when it's spread all over the place, and, and everything here is so wacky well, it's as all far like, as the layout. Well, there was... Flustered. There was something... Oh, was, yeah, I mean, well, and, you know, everybody... Everybody who's from LA or been to LA and is familiar with the with the freeway system, you just think to yourself like there there had to have been a better way to figure this out. <laughs> to, to get you back know? to the and, and it seemed like like they build one and it's like oh, okay now we need to sort of expand this because we kind of screwed up and it's just like a, a constant you know like laying track in front of the train to stop the problem you know yeah well there's uh, to get back to the to the movie one thing mm-hmm. that was the really movie, well yeah really well done is there is a uh, the part where the red car gets bought up by Cloverleaf is very parallel yes. to what happened in real life yeah. so much so that they made a commission to figure out if it was true because uh, GM at that point actually had a company that they were actually buying uh, transportation companies so mm-hmm. they could re- so they could replace things so that I, I love when movies tie into real life events to add to the the story Wait a minute. So right, you, the so kernel you're of to truth tell me that they actually destroyed bullshit, Toontown? You know? Of course. GM hates cartoons. <laughs> 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 but, um, yeah, back to the actual idea of this movie. I, I mean, for uh, 88, I, I am just still watching it, and now it's just amazing that 24 years later that uh, how – how well this movie still holds up. Yeah, it it's has a an really aged amazing either. thing. I mean, yeah, totally. I mean, it's not like the right, gra- well, well, like okay. a, the similar with as much animation and effects like Wrath of the Titans has a lot of stop motion, mm-hmm. and that aged horribly within a decade. Well, this is tw- about a, this is twenty years. What is it? And Peach it still Dragon. Looks, yeah, see that that that's definitely that's I think that's around seventy something, and that a decade later it really aged. This is yeah. twenty four yeah. years later, and it's still. It still looks like it come out tomorrow and look brand new. There's only mm-hmm. a, a couple scenes where I noticed like a, the hand was off just slightly, but that was mostly when he's holding a bulky gun type thing. And right. you know, to mention today's standards, I mean, we look at something of the lines of the movie that we just did recently, Oz the Great and Powerful, where uh, Franco's handling the China girl. I mean, there's still things where it's like. A millimeter off and you can right. see that and that's still transference of the this movie made in 1988 where i mean the transference is just still like a millimeter off well, I, right so, i mean that goes have into, an actor who has to be aware of, of the spatial uh, uh awareness you know what i yeah. mean like how big is the cup that i'm holding in my hand it's not really there see yeah, here, here, my, one second there's an early scene where bob hopkins or Hoskins, I keep saying Hopskins, and it's not Hopskins, it's Hoskins. Anyway, um, he's coming down the stairs, and he gets bumped by a, by a, a hippo in a dress. Yeah. And that part right there, he didn't get bumped by anything. He's coming down the stairs, and as somebody out there, you know, or he just remembers that on this step, I have to give this much space for this right. hippo to, that's bumping me that's not really there so i mean that's right. just amazing acting ability uh, uh as far as hoskins is concerned that's just fantastic no i agree right. so i mean <clears throat> I, and i love i love how all the, the the like when eddie valiant uh played by bob hoskins is talking to a cartoon character how you can actually see they're looking at each other and the way the camera work is and the, the animation it looks it generally like 99 percent of the time it lines up perfectly yeah yeah. I mean, that's the part that it always seemed amazing to me is they really do look like they're interacting. And between the way they made it look like 1947, you know, everything is really well done. And that's yeah. why I think one of the reasons it aged so well is it doesn't take place in 1988. Yeah. And, and another thing is, um, uh, Ryan, did, did you see this one in theaters? No, I didn't. I, I, I was probably Two. four, three or four years old. Oh, come on. I'm going to have to talk with your parents. 
Um, Ryan. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure I ended up getting it on on video a couple of years later. Yeah, John, you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I did too. And I'm talking with Jen, and she's my wife, and she's sitting there and, and just kind of like, I, I, she doesn't want Allie, our, our daughter, to see this yet. She doesn't want her to see it because of there's so much sexual uh, references, kind of innuendos. In see, there. kids don't. It, has she seen the patty that, cake scene? Well, well, not, well yeah. Well, yeah, I was kind of joking question. with her, going, "You want to play patty cake later?" Well, here's my <laughs> question: Has Allie seen Shrek? Yeah. Shrek is a thousand times worse than this movie because you you got stuff like Farquad. Oh, I think he's making up for something. Yeah, this I, this movie is nowhere near as bad as modern day cartoons. I agree, and that's kind of where I'm at. I'm like, you know, I saw this when I was at a young age, and she's kind of like, well, there's this burlesque scene where she's dancing and singing and kind of getting up on them, and I'm like, you know, even still, that's like it doesn't register. There's no frame it's, of reference. Yeah, that's, that's there's no frame of reference. Say, James, it's it's. it's it's always been the same thing. There, there's always been. They still do it to this day. They make these movies that have these jokes that adults get, but are really ambiguous towards kids. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? They just they don't understand that that's the joke. Yeah. You there's, know what I'm saying? So, or or that that's something that's that's a little you know slightly risque, like like that scene you're talking about. Um, and but they've done it forever. They still do it today, like you said with Shrek. Yeah. There's so, jokes that just fly right over the heads of kids. That the adults are going to get. And then there's things also in there that are just for the kids. That the adults are going to kind of, you know, passively maybe giggle at or something. See, I think the the, the burlesque scene is even more ambiguous. Because there's a child you have no frame of reference. It looks like somebody singing. As, exactly. a, a, as an adult, you, you realize, okay, this is a little risque. Shrek, you have context for it. Well, yeah, on Shrek, on the other hand, it's very apparent. If you're if you're a kid past the age of eight, you get what they're talking about. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that it's a movie that that I really enjoyed as a kid. I love this movie. I mean, you got so many different characters. You have Dumbo early that that yeah. kids recognize. You've got well, the Fantasia James, guys. What, what about all the, uh, the 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 fantasy elements? How many how many kids? which is pretty much everybody who's ever seen this movie has wanted to take the the black hole dot and yeah. throw it against the wall. Exactly. Just like the cop did. He's like, yeah, look at this. That's what I'm saying, dude. Like, there's, the, I want to play with everything in there. To this day, I'm, I'm almost 30, dude, and I'll watch yeah. that movie to this day and be like, God damn it, I want one of those black dots. Like, I love And one of those hammers with the, with the fist that comes out. Two yeah. of my two of my favorite scenes in that movie. It's in the it's the same scene, but you know where he's he's stuck behind the magnet, so he uses the black hole and the the middle of the magnet disappears. Yeah. And when he busts out the singing sword, you know it's witchcraft. He's like looking at the sword, going Sinatra. Yeah, and he's going yeah. crap. You know what I find is funny is that if you look at the IMDb of that, they actually go it's Frank Sinatra archived. Right. I'm like, are you kidding me? I, I want my bulls to talk to me. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> What? 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 Oh yeah! I said I want my bullets to talk to yeah. me. Yeah. Now I still I, I try awesome. to do it to to the. I was gonna do it when I watched it recently. Is you know try to read the whole thing, but that's from Yosemite Sam. The gun. Really? That's oh, what I, is it? Yeah, that's what I think it said on there. I have to go back and look, but it looked like it was from Yosemite Sam was gave him the gun. Really? Right on. Yeah, I was like, you know, that's pretty freaking cool. How much detail they went into it. I would right. love to have that gun, and I'm still pissed off that he had two bullets left and threw the whole gun down. Yeah, that bummed me out. That, Especially that because really they were like alive and then just sitting in there. Yeah, yeah. According yeah. to the according to this uh, Disney Wiki article, it says uh, it's unknown to exactly when Yosemite gave the gun to Eddie after the death of Eddie's brother Teddy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I caught it. I caught it while it was playing. I, I read as much as I could, and it said from Yosemite Sam. That's awesome. So yeah, which is kind of funny because then he walks up and Yosemite Sam doesn't even say, "Hey, what's up, Eddie?" You know, but he goes, "My biscuits are burning. My biscuits are burning." <laughs> this, this was also the first time you had uh, you had Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse in the same scene yes. together ever. First yeah. time, and it's probably the last time it's happened since. It's, it is Ain't the last time. You'll never see that again. Because obviously, the, um, at, a, at a time when a lot of these things were, you know, in the 88, Warner Brothers' uh, heyday, or what they assumed was their heyday, was 40 years behind them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, same thing with, with uh, uh, Disney. They had, you know, some stuff coming out, 
you know, a few years later, they'd start making their their Aladdins and whatnot. But I mean, a lot of their things were were from the seventies, and you know, and, yeah. and a little bit later. Which is so funny because they, I, I imagine it was not a long conversation with Steven Spielberg, like you said, to talk him into, hey, let's get all these characters at once. It'll remind everybody about all these awesome cartoons. We'll make it a little self aware. And I'm sure people went out and bought them, but nowadays they'll never do it just because every single one of those characters, with the, just the advent of the internet, is at a complete premium. Yeah, you know. Um, but you also see that they kind of turned it around after this movie, and I mean, you got the uh, the Looney Tunes came back on, mm-hmm. and then they quite, turned quite, into yeah. to, to Animaniacs. I mean, how great was that show? The but, best, Steven Spielberg. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Anyway, um. But you know, there's that. There's a lot of banter between Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse, which I thought was pretty funny because those were the the two dominant characters of both of those studios. Yeah, they're the, they're the face of the studios. Yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, you you drive in L.A. I mean, around Burbank and and where like Disney Studios are, and you, every single fence post is in the shape of Disney's head yeah. or in uh, Mickey's head. I mean, yeah. Then you look at. Um, at the end, where I mean, even Porgy the Pig, you know, was that's all, folks. I thought hey, that was I, amazing. I, I like the sound of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, ratings, guys. I uh, I'll go first. I'll give this a five. I just because it's it's still it's it's one of the movies that no matter where it is, I'll still watch it. It's still it still transports me to a t- one time when I was a kid. And you still catch stuff that you never noticed before, whether it's small details or it's certain comments yeah. or certain historical background, like with a red line. I it just overall, it's an awesome movie. I, I still enjoy this movie. Yeah, Ryan, um, I'm gonna give it a five, but for a, for a really specific reason. Um, Four stars are are all because of just my favorite parts, and like you said, I, anytime this is on TV, I don't give a shit what part it is. I'm gonna watch the rest of it. Um, the reason it gets to a five is because the the way that it holds up. The when you see characters like like Roger Rabbit or, or Bugs Bunny or Daffy Duck or any of these these characters, the, the way that you've always consumed those characters has been 2D in a cartoon. So when you see them in this movie, they're still presented to you as the 2D drawn animation cartoon. So it holds up forever because that's exactly how they're supposed to look, even mm-hmm. if they're in a live action world. You know what I mean? Like it's it's so so perfect the way that worked out that no matter a hundred years from now, you could watch it and be like, oh well, of course that doesn't look crappy because that's what Roger Rabbit would look like if he was in in the real world, a 2D animated character. So you know, uh, it, it, yeah, just that that evergreen quality to it is is an immediate five. I and, and Christopher agree. Lloyd, uh, I, I love in this movie so damn much. Such a wacky character he plays. Yeah. What about you? You know, this movie I, I've probably been about eight years since I've seen it, something like that. Where probably right when I got it, I watched the watched it when I bought the first disc. And you know, even watching it now, it's like I can quote. Mm-hmm practically almost the whole movie and that speaks for itself alone and it's just a straight out early five you know i mean i could watch this over 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 and over again and i plan on having my kids watch this movie well yeah it's it's definitely one of those like you haven't seen that movie stop what you're doing and get it you know what i mean definitely doesn't matter who you're talking to yeah so uh, I was say, now with the movie movie news portion of the show, and this week it's James 